In North Carolina, a local cemetery holds a deadly secret. What if he really is seeing ghosts? Bodies may lie in peace, but their spirits may be anything but restful. And what if it doesn't stop? What do we do then? In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Jamie Bruce and Aaron Pennington grew up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. A longtime couple, they decide to buy a house together in the historic neighborhood of Jackson Acres. It'll take some work to make it ours, but the foundation is solid and the neighborhood is great. Yeah, this house was my first house. Nothing extravagant about it, but it was a start and it was near Jamie's family. My vision for the house was being able to raise our children in the backyard and visualizing the, them being on the swing set and playing and running around and laughing and riding their bikes and calling it our own. What do you think? I think it's home. In the fall of 2008, the couple is settled in their new home with their two children one-year-old Lacey and three-year-old Mason. And this one. Baseball. Baseball! What's that one? Aaron and Jamie enjoy their new neighborhood, but they have no idea that mysterious neighbors will change their lives forever. Almost every week, the family takes advantage of the local parks. One in particular becomes a favorite Curiously, it's attached to a cemetery. The cemetery is only a few houses over from my house and across the street, and it's a very old cemetery, family owned and kept up, and I believe it's as old as Civil War time. I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna check it out. Okay, we'll wait out here for you. Jamie notices Mason seems preoccupied with something he sees and hears. Hey Mason, are you feeling okay? I want to go home. Let's go home. Okay, come on. Come on. <laughs> on weeknights, Aaron works the late shift as a manager at a trucking company. Sometimes he doesn't get home until dawn. Good night, Dad. I love you. Hey, Patty, let me talk to him. Hey, any idea what time you'll be getting home? I wish I knew. Still waiting for uh, two more trucks to come in. My work schedule is usually kind of like a second and third shift combined. You go in at two, three, but you don't really know when you're going to get home. And it puts a lot more responsibility on Jamie. I miss him, and the kids miss him, and we just wished he could be home more. Jamie settles in for another evening without Aaron. But she and her children are not alone. A man came 
Look, Mason, there's nowhere else to hide in here. We are alone. Look, there's no one here. A few hours later, when Aaron comes home, he learns of his son's dream. What was unusual about it was, because this was totally out of the ordinary for my son to make up something like this. Oh, hey. Mm, what are you doing awake, huh? He wouldn't go back to bed until you got home. The next morning, after Aaron and Mason leave the house, Jamie finds herself experiencing the unexplained. I went walking into the kitchen, and all the cabinet doors in the top were opened. My first instinct was maybe I had done this myself. Don't really know why I would have left every single door standing wide open, but that was my first instinct. But still in the back of my mind, it just didn't make sense. Jamie tries to dismiss the experiences and goes about her routine. Yeah, let me see those grubby hands of yours. Oh, they're filthy. Filthy, filthy. Other one. All right, buddy. I'm gonna grab you a towel, OK? But that soon proves to be impossible. I had stepped out of the bathroom to grab a towel to get him out of the bath. And as I stepped into the hall, he started having like a serious conversation. Mason, are you talking to someone? Mm -hmm. And I kind of listened for a minute. Couldn't really make out what my son was saying. Mason, who are you talking to? Gable. Is Gable one of your toys? Uh-uh, he's a man. A man? Uh-huh. He was right here, but when he left. For the first time, Jamie begins to worry. Could Gable be more than a figment of her son's imagination? Could her neighborhood or her house be haunted. Mason, Mommy and I want to ask you something. Where did you hear the name Gable? Was it on TV or at school? He told me. Who told you? Gable. And I still kept thinking that maybe he was just imagining, and he kept telling me he was real. He promised he was real. Honey, we know that Gable isn't a real person. He's so real. OK, well, um, if he's real, then where is he? In real. Gable's in the bedroom? OK, well, why don't you go and get him? Tell him we want to talk to him. My heart dropped a little bit at that moment when he said he's back here in the bedroom. And that's when I said, well, if he's back there, go get him. I tell him I want to talk to Gable. He really did walk back there and talked, said something. Where's Gable? Right here. Gable's where? Right here. Well, if he's right there, then why can't I see him? He's right well. He continued to say over and over again, Mommy, he's real. He's right here. He's standing right there. He sees you. He's right here. Can you ask Gable a question for me? Ask him what five plus six is. I knew that my son could not add. He knew his ABCs, and he knew his colors, and he knew how to count, but he did not know how to add. 
our mouths just drop. Oh my gosh, what do you think now? What do you what are you supposed to believe in? Do you do you believe your child now or not? Jamie and Aaron are shocked that they may have a ghost lurking in the shadows of their home, and its target may be their son. It kind of sends some chills, chills up my back. What if there is a ghost in here by the name of Gabe, and my son's telling them the truth? Their friend Pam Marsh is starting to believe it as well. Stop, it's my turn. I said, stop it. Mason, is Gable going to be joining us for dinner? Her son's demeanor let us know that this was something very serious by the look on his face. Uh-uh, he has to walk. We questioned him. And the answers he gave us let us know that he really believed this. Mason, quit being silly and go get ready for dinner. Come on, we can't play in here. It was really odd that he believed so intensely. I'm beginning to believe him. Me too. It was pretty weird. And he was dead serious. Miss Hamilton? Yes. I'm Jamie, Mason's mother. Of course, good to see you Hi. again. Seeking a rational explanation. Jamie consults Mason's preschool teacher. Wow, he did very well. Listen, I know this may sound like an odd question, but does the name Gable mean anything to you? Gable? No. I don't think so. Mason's been talking about someone named Gable, and I thought maybe it was someone in your class or a character from a book you read to the children. I've never heard the name Gable before. It's an unusual name. Maybe you heard it on TV. He couldn't have gotten it from anywhere else, um, not even off of television. He watched Elmo. I mean, they, I don't know of anywhere else he could have come up with such a name. I had to finally trust in my child and believe that he was definitely seeing someone or something. In the following days, Jamie is on high alert, watching for any signs that Gable is real. At times, I have felt like something was standing behind me and watching me. I was a little unsure if my mom was overreacting or if something really was watching me. You had it in the back of your mind like something wasn't right. Something was you felt out of place. Seeking comfort from her friend Pam, Jamie is interrupted this time by mysterious sounds. I just don't know what to say to him anymore. I mean, he talks to Gable more than he talks to me. <laughs> Please, you know Aaron. He has an explanation for everything. But he doesn't have to spend half the night here alone. I think someone's in the house. Shh, 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 shh. Just hang on a second. There was nothing there. The kids were fast asleep. There is something going on in this house, Aaron. I'm, I'm hearing noises. There's, there's loud noises. All right, just slow down. 
they found like bike chains, like bike chains hitting the floor, and it was loud, and I have no idea how the kids didn't wake up. Or did, did, I don't did know you how they check the rest of the house. Yeah, I did. I checked the rest of the house. Everything's fine, but I know I heard something coming out of that room. I believe you did hear something, but it couldn't have been a chain falling. It was probably just something in the heating system. I myself always look for answers. If it's something's broken, I want to fix it. If it's unexplained, I want to explain it. That's my, I guess, my thought process is there's an explanation for everything. Aaron never seemed overwhelmed. He was just wanting me to understand that he's listening. Jamie tries to convince herself there is nothing to fear that her home is a safe haven where she can be protected from the outside world. But something wants her to feel otherwise. I looked up at the monitor to check on the children, and I saw smoke, real thick smoke, going from one side of the TV to the next. I got up there, and there was nothing there. There was no smell. There was no smoke. Nothing. I called Aaron, and he said that if you saw smoke, then there has to be an explanation as to why there was smoke. Everything looks fine. Maybe what you saw was static. The camera could have picked up some kind of interference. No, no, I know what I saw. It was smoke. Maybe this was Gable. I thought in the back of my mind that it was possible that this, uh, there was something that was trying to communicate with me to let me know that it is there and is present. Oh, whatever it was. It's over now. Nobody got hurt. Let's let it go. Call the night. Fine. The children are staying in our room tonight. Aaron and Mason are finally able to rest, but their daughter Lacey is not. <laughs> and Jamie is terrified because she knows why. What are we supposed to do? My children are my world, and to have something that scaring them or bothering them is just devastating. I'll stay out with her tonight. And what if it doesn't stop? What do we do then? Jamie is now convinced that the entities seen by her children may not be imaginary. I've never heard my daughter scream like that. She just kept looking like... like something was in there. I mean, she probably just had a bad dream. Well, of course, when Jamie told me what had happened, I said, did she have a nightmare? And Jamie's like, no, this is different. She said, Pam, there was actually fear in my little girl's eyes. I don't believe in ghosts, but I don't know how else to explain it. Stuff like this has been happening ever since Mason started talking to Gable. What if he really 
is seeing ghosts. While Aaron again works late, Jamie tries to sleep, unaware that Gable may not be the only entity haunting her house. <laughs> I finally braved up enough to pull the covers down, and there was nothing there. When I heard the laugh, it was as loud as I'm talking right now, and only about two or three feet away from me. And it was just so real. That's when I realized that this was real, that there was definitely something in my house. And at that point, I was terrified. When Aaron returns home, he knows his family's life has dramatically changed. We're all now in the living room, all together, one big bedroom. Now, it's Aaron's turn to listen. I start hearing this like three notes, same notes, same rhythm, over and over. And I'm sitting there listening to it and it don't stop. It just don't stop. It goes on for like five minutes. I'm thinking maybe it's a little kid's uh, little toy pianos in the basement or maybe it's something in my closet. I don't know. I didn't know what it was. I'm sitting there trying to figure it out what is this noise. Aaron is determined to find an explanation. But now he himself begins to wonder, what if there isn't one? And I listened, and sure enough, it was a piano playing, just plain as day, and it sounded like it was in the next room. What is it? I've searched the entire house. I can't figure out where it's coming from. It sounds like our old piano. We used to have a piano in our home when we first moved there. That doesn't make any sense. First Gable, then a child's laughter. Now, terrifying sounds. What could be next? I woke up to a real muffled sound. It's like they heard us. We interrupted them. What I had heard, 100%, I knew that there was no denying that. 
Jamie and Aaron both realize they need help, and they need it fast. For more A Haunting, go to DestinationAmerica.com. Jamie and Aaron are horrified and confused by events occurring in their North Carolina home. Jamie has decided it's time to figure out what could be causing the bizarre behavior. I finally had to do some research and figure out, you know, how bad these things can actually get. I was bound and determined that I was not gonna let it get to that point. But helpful information comes in a most unexpected way. We're back with best-selling author Philip James. Mr. James is a paranormal researcher and investigator, and he's written a new book called Earthbound Spirits. A lot of times we are From an unlikely source, Aaron learns for the first time how they might deal with paranormal activity. The expert had said that if it knows that you're aggravated. It feeds off of that. It's going to continue. It's not going to stop. Jamie learns that the most important thing she can do to rid her house of the entity is to face her fear. Mommy. I'm sorry, sweetie. Did I wake you? No, it was Gable. He wants to play. Is Gable here right now? He's in real. I decided to be strong. I was going to stand up for myself, for my children, and for my home. Gable, I need you to leave our house now. It's time for Mason to go to bed, and you're keeping him awake. I looked over that direction, and I told Gable that he needed to leave, that it was time for our son to go to bed. He holds you. He, he's going good in the following weeks the house remains quiet and peaceful jamie ignores her fears and reclaims her life she has no idea that the entities in her home are changing their focus from her children to her Something had stepped on the back of my pants legs. It startled me, but I ignored it. As I go to get up the steps, I realized I forgot to cut the dryer on. back of my calf. I felt like it just wanted me to know that it was still there. At that point, I lost it. I knew then that it can get physical. What happens if it touched my children? She called me hysterical. She said something you need to get home. <laughs> it kept pulling me down. Are you OK? It bothered me to think that it's OK if something can touch you. That's, that's a whole different ball game. Because if they can do that, what else can they do? Stay out of the basement. I'm on my way. If you're here, I want to see you. I wanted to let it know, hey, this is my way of inviting you. Got the lights off, it's just me and you. You really want me to believe in you? Come on out! Quit playing games! I was so angry at it, I wanted to see it. But the entity remains hidden. Gable! If you're in here, show yourself! When Jamie's friend Pam Marsh learns of the heightened paranormal activity, she enlists the aid of investigators Pam Nance and Ashley Field. 
After reviewing the past events, they are puzzled until they suddenly make a connection to the graveyard near the home. The family had visited this cemetery on their property. When they came back from the cemetery, shortly thereafter, the activity started, which leads me to believe that they brought something back with them. When the investigators arrive at the house, they find unusually high levels of electromagnetic energy, signs that supernatural entities are indeed present. They decide to try to communicate with whomever or whatever is occupying the house by videotaping an EVP session and record electronic voice phenomena. Gable, are you here? Once the EVP session started, you could feel an energy build in the room. Are you here because of Mason? Do you want to play with Mason? Who is here with you? I very rarely hear voices with my naked ear on an investigation, but this investigation was different. The, the feeling in the room became just one of complete uneasiness. It was not going to get better. It was going to get worse. Jamie, would you turn on the light? It felt like a bubble was forming on the front of that mirror and pushing out a very negative energy, and it was about to explode. Paranormal investigators Pam Nance and Ashley Field cannot believe their eyes as they watch something try to emerge through a mirror in Jamie and Aaron's home, an entity they immediately decide they need to stop. Many people believe that mirrors can actually act as a portal between our world and the spirit world. There have actually been reports of entities coming through mirrors. I think there's something trying to get through. At that moment in time, had I not stopped, I think the activity would have escalated on a level no one had seen yet by what would have been brought in. I knew immediately that I needed to do something before this bubble of negativity exploded outwards into the room. Investigator Ashley Field has come prepared for a purifying ritual. The cleansing of the mirrors with this lemon-based water is a low country recipe to seal a portal. The investigator knows that the power is not only in the recipe. Cleansing is all about intent. It's not a power that anybody gives you. It's all about your intentions, what you're putting out there. If you're putting out good and you're wishing for good and you want the bad gone and you're pushing away negative energy, it's like getting away from bad people. Now we just have to get rid of what's already here. The sage will free the room of the spirits. The investigator uses a Native American tradition known as smudging to purify the air. You start from the center of the room and you move outward, pushing all of the negativity out of the room. You start in one room and you keep moving through each room you have to have a door or a window cracked prior to starting this process so whatever's in there can leave. Otherwise, you're just chasing it from room to room.
Next, she salts the property, a Christian tradition in the South. Salt's used for its protective qualities. It's a pure substance. It also repels evil. You start from the center of the room and you flick the salt forward. The salt water I used was from an outgoing tide. It's based on the same principle of baptism in the ocean. You always baptize on an outgoing tide to pull away your sins and the negative. With the cleansing complete, the investigators hope to be able to confirm that the entities are gone. They are not. I typically take three photographs at a time. The first photograph was normal. Second photograph, there was a very dark shadow coming down across the camera's field of vision. The third photograph, clear again. And at that exact same moment, we did get a spike on our EMF meter. The investigators conclude there is only one other way to complete the cleansing of the home. They need to return to the place where the bizarre occurrences began. Pam, come look at this. When we went back to the cemetery, we were reading the grave markers, and there was a grave for Gabriel. Gabriel Jackson, 1838 to 1864. He was the son of the original plantation owner. He had been in the Civil War and had been killed in the Civil War. The trauma of that sudden death is the perfect storm for a restless spirit. We associated that Gabriel with the gable that the little boy was experiencing. The investigators also learned that the spirit of the laughing young girl taunting Jamie might also have a physical connection to the area. In our research, we did find that there was a group of ponds behind the original home place, and the story goes that a young girl drowned there. We suspect that the little girl may have been a slave on the original plantation. She died a traumatic death, a sudden death. As we've seen through other investigations, she may not realize that she is deceased. She may still think she's living. She's still acting out the same lifestyle she was living before her death. I feel like that this is still their land in their eyes, and that's why they're still roaming around. With the investigators now understanding the entities at hand, can they finally free Jamie and her family from their paranormal nightmare? For Jamie and Aaron, what began as a visit from their son Mason's imaginary friend Gable has evolved into a paranormal experience for the entire family. Investigators have determined that more than one entity haunts the home. While they now have an idea who these lost souls might be, they know there is only one way to put them to rest, through the power of prayer. Now I need you to do something. I need you to say a blessing, to complete the cleansing, and to reclaim your house. The homeowner should always be present when you do a cleansing. It's their home. They have to take back ownership. They need to be there with you. They need to reiterate and reinforce what you're doing. Because when you leave, it's just them again. Kind of blessing any kind, as long as it's something you truly believe in. To effectively do a cleanse, it has to be based on what the homeowner believes in. Our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses.
forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God. And lead us not into temptation. <laughs> Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. <laughs> the power and the glory. Forever. Gable! If you're in here, show yourself! They're gone, aren't they? Nothing here can hurt you now. It was a, a long night, but I really appreciate you all coming. Hey. Oh. Get any sleep? No, no sleep. Thank you. You've given me my home back. We didn't do that. You did that. The power and the rituals came from you. And if anything like this starts up again, just remember, you're strong enough to stop it yourself. Thank you. I was very thankful for having them come and to give me that strength and to know that no matter what, I own that home. I knew by them telling me that I could do this and that I was strong enough to do this, that I could do it. And I was determined I was going to do exactly what they said. For Jamie, Aaron, Mason, and Lacey, their paranormal nightmare is over. Hey! Oh, I missed you! After the cleanse, it was like a huge burden lifted. Jamie was smiling more. She felt validated. It's kind of like maybe we can pick up where we left off. You know, it's time to focus on other stuff. Oh, it's okay! Hey, it's okay! You ready? Talking with the neighbors made me realize that we were not the only ones experiencing this and that it was the land, I believe, is what is where it's all coming from. Before I would listen to the stories I've seen on TV, I've always just automatically thought there's always an explanation. Now that I've seen it and heard things, there has to be more. If you're close-minded to any idea, then the less you're ever going to learn. I would tell any, any skeptic to be more open-minded. You just need to listen. Just listen. A man in love becomes the target of a deadly spirit. Uh, it was five marks, like somebody had really dug in and scraped down. Determined to keep him in its clutches. This entity was attached to Charles. She was very jealous, very possessive, and very angry. He searches his family's tragic past for clues. My grandfather mentioned something like brujeria, which is like Spanish for witchcraft. Now, he must destroy the evil before it destroys him. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows and in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see Someone's in my room. and the things we fear, there are doors when they are opened. Nightmares become reality. Just north of the trendy and fast-paced city of Miami rests the tranquil seashore of Hollywood, Florida. It's definitely a place to be. It's so relaxing and you get away from everyday life and it's so awesome just walking by the beach. I, I love it. In 2010, Charles Gonzalez invites his new girlfriend, Hannah, a single mother of two, over for dinner. 
I met Hannah through a mutual friend of ours. Things were getting a little bit serious between us, so I did want her, you know, to meet my mom. Mama, look who's here. Ah! <laughs> Hello. Oh, beautiful. So nice to meet you. For me? Thank you. Sit down, sit down. It's going to get cold. Gracias, mama. Ladies first. Thank you. My mom liked what she saw. She liked my mom. They got along pretty well, you know. It, it, was, it was definitely a good day. Back in Bogota, we used to have these huge family dinners. <laughs> Mama would prepare this delicious feast. <laughs> I came from Bogota, Colombia. I was born there. It's always in my heart. You know, it's where I grew up. Well, tell me, what was it like? <laughs> uh, well, there were a lot of us. And we all lived in the same house, if you can believe that. I grew up with my mom. My grandfather, my grandma, my uncle, my aunt, cousins. Uh, it was a big family. Why? It's just a joke. OK, stop playing around, you two. Grandpa's coming home soon. Sorry. Hola, how are you? Hola. Hola. ¿Cómo están? Bien, ¿cómo te fue el día? Estuvo un poco caliente, a little bit hot. But it was good, muy buen día. My grandfather, he did major projects all over the city, building homes. I never saw him resting. He was the head of household. He was the backbone of the family. I mean, he was such a presence to respect. Déjame ayudarte. Gracias. So, how do I look? Good. Like his grandfather, Charles's uncle Alfonso also played a big role in his life. My father died at a very young age, so he was the one that really kind of helped me grow up and, and, and tell me what I needed to know. To me, he was like my dad. He raised me. I looked up to him. You need is just a dab. Trust me, ladies love it. My uncle's a very sharp man. He had that swag to him. He was a ladies' man. He was very classy. And yeah, it, girls sure loved him. <laughs> that I remember. Ay, ay, ay. Such a shame we had to leave. Well, have you ever gone back? No. I miss the family, too. I think about the Alfonso Abuelo every day. In 1990, Charles's family suffered a series of tragedies, including the deaths of his uncle and grandfather. It's the year that I wouldn't wish to my worst enemy. My uncle was assassinated. He was murdered. Nobody really found out why, who did it. Then I had my grandfather pass away after that. My grandfather was the healthiest man you could find. He was not sick at all. He just passed away. Just like that, just that quick.
Soon after, Charles and his mother moved to the United States in hopes of leaving the past behind. Hey, don't cry, mommy. They're still here with us. Just because we cannot see them, they're still making sure we're okay. So I thought that went well. Yeah, I had a really great time tonight. <laughs> Your mom is so sweet. I knew you guys would hit it off. You know, I really loved hearing about your family in Bogota. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's just so sad hearing about all those deaths happening at the same time. It's like your family's, I don't know, cursed or something. <clears throat> Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'd better get out of here. I told the babysitter I'd be home by 10. Okay. But I'll see you this weekend. Good night. Despite the years that have passed, childhood memories continue to haunt Charles. After my uncle died, I started seeing some pretty weird things in the house. I just kept hearing noises, something loud, bang, boom. Like, trying to get my attention. Right after his beloved uncle Alfonso was murdered in Bogota, Colombia, Charles Gonzalez began witnessing supernatural events. The flies were making some kind of shape looking like a shadow, almost like a person. I couldn't believe it. I was like, it's not happening. After my uncle passed away, I was a little bit creeped out. People were saying around town that there was a curse on, put on him. Now, 20 years later, as an adult living in Hollywood, Florida, the past has mysteriously come back to haunt Charles. I just heard a loud noise, like when somebody hits something really hard. And I, I just remember just jumping out of bed, and I was like, whoa. I'm 
hearing like footsteps coming slowly towards me. Who's in there? <laughs> that night, that's when I knew, okay, I'm not alone. There's definitely something here with me. For the first time in years, Charles has had a paranormal encounter. He contacts his good friend Pedro Rivera, who recently began working with the Paranormal Consulting Agency. Pedro was involved with a paranormal group, and I was like, he's going to know somebody that can help me. Hey, man. Pedro. Hey, man. What's, What's going on? on? You want to break up or something? What? No. No, no, it's not that. No, we're doing great. Charles is a good friend of mine. I've known Charles since middle school. So what's up, then? I had an encounter last night. Something I hadn't felt since Michael's funeral in Colombia. About a year ago is when Charles shared some stories about his childhood. You mean it was supernatural? And we have long conversations about ghosts and apparitions and poltergeists and all that. I just, I don't know what's going on, man, after all these years. You know, there's got to be a reason, right? There's got to be a reason. Whatever it was, it got my attention. I felt like if it was a spirit, it was maybe trying to watch out for me, perhaps. Don't worry, all right? We'll figure something out. Pedro asks the psychic medium on his paranormal team for help. She requests minimal information, just Charles's first name. Being a physical medium, I usually can feel a, a spirit. Telepathically, they speak to me. There was a small Spanish man. He had a bandana or like a handkerchief around his neck and was in like work clothes. He was saying to me, something's buried, something's buried. And he was just very adamant about it. This is about whatever was buried. After an encounter with an eerie presence. Who's in there? Even though I was alone, I felt something like the chills would go through my body. 
And the last time I ever experienced that was back in Colombia, right after my uncle passed away. Um, I didn't know if it was paranormal. I didn't know what to call it. I just knew that it wasn't right. I knew it wasn't something that was supposed to be happening. I was really worried, and I needed to get something done and, and done ASAP. Charles Gonzalez seeks help from a paranormal investigative team. One of the members, a psychic medium, receives a message from a mysterious spirit. It can be very confusing as far as when a spirit trying to tell you something, because the message isn't always exactly clear. All I knew that it was, it was a warning. That's psychic. She described my grandfather to a T. She described this man exactly as my grandfather would look. It's a strong, short man, gray hair, rough hands. Like he's been working. The way he was dressed, color handkerchief that, that he's wearing, that's my grandfather. What else did she say? She thinks he wanted to relay some kind of warning, that he's trying to protect you somehow. She kept saying it had to do with something that was buried. Do you have any idea what he's talking about? Suddenly, Charles recalls something from his childhood. A clay figure. An object he found after his uncle Alfonso was murdered. Charles, what are you doing? Ma said to help out. You're always playing around. So? What's the problem with that? Charles, find something to do. <sighs> do you always have to push me around? I'm just trying to have fun. Jeez. Wow. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No. this thing out of the dirt and it was made out of clay and just looked like a like a person if it had a face and everything and carved in it are his uncle alfonso's initials what did you get this it was in there. It was buried in the planter. It was just kind of weird that this thing would be buried in so deep and in, in a pot full of dirt. Why would it have my uncle's initials in it? Clean up this mess now. La Bruja. My grandfather mentioned something like Santeria or Brujeria, which is like Spanish for witchcraft. What is that thing? I want you to stay outside. Why? What's wrong? Go! Charles's grandfather heads for the family prayer room. It was common, you know, for family to have their prayer room. If anyone of our family passed away, they would pray for the souls to make sure that they were, you know, doing okay wherever they were. Oh. 
No, Dios mío, no. Right, fuck. Somebody went in there and just started smashing everything, glass everywhere. Those crucifixes were upside down. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> There was a picture of my uncle. Charles Gonzalez has been haunted by something evil, and his past may hold the answers. After the murder of his uncle in Bogota, Colombia, Charles, then just a boy, unearthed a mysterious clay object outside his home, bearing his uncle's initials. only to then discover the family prayer room destroyed. <sighs> And his uncle's photo defaced. It's like a bunch of needles going through his face. This is very disturbing. My grandfather, he was pretty, pretty shaken. He fell to the floor and he started crying. No, Dios mío, no. I had never seen him cry before. <laughs> the clay object appears to be the source of what happened in the past. My grandfather believed it was created by black magic. And it has something to do with my uncle's death. Wow, that's intense with the shrine and the upside down crosses and all that, it had to do with something evil. Did they ever find out who did it? No. My mom kept me away from all that stuff. So I never really knew what was going on. Then about a year later, we moved. What happened to the clay object? I don't know. My grandfather probably destroyed it. It's so weird. Why would he be trying to warn me about it after all these years? My grandfather is trying to tell me that, you know, be careful, you're being protected, but there's something going on. Maybe I should pay attention. There's more to his uncle's story. One afternoon, Charles meets up with his girlfriend, Hannah, but he can't stop thinking about the past. There was definitely a feeling in the air that it wasn't, something just wasn't 100% right. I was very kind of on edge. My girlfriend noticed it too, you know, she's like, you know, you're not really being yourself. I feel like we haven't hung out in a while. Seems stressed. You know you can tell me anything. 
If something's wrong, I want to help. There's nothing wrong. Actually, I'm just happy that you're here with me. I just wish you didn't have to go home. Well, kids are staying at my mom's tonight, so I'm all yours. Are you? I was like, oh, go away. It's not a big deal. Everything's fine. It felt like, like somebody had walked through, like somebody had been there. It made my, the hairs all over my body stand in one end. Gonzalez has just been attacked. I felt just this intense burning sensation in my leg. Ah. How did that happen? It was five marks, like somebody had really dug in and scraped down. Do you have any bandages? Grab some peroxide. Hannah? What's wrong? She lifts up her wrist and shows me, and there is the same scratch that I had in my leg on her wrist. Charles's worst fear is confirmed. Some kind of evil spirit is after him, and now his girlfriend. She was upset. She was shaken up. What is going on, Charles? I need you to tell me the truth. You remember that night you met my mom, right? The, the, the story uh, about the curse? Uh, I don't know if it's something something supernatural or... or... <laughs> Or what, what's going on? I don't know. If this can attack me, what about my kids? I can't let anything happen to them. The news is too much for his girlfriend to handle. She had never had to deal with any situation like that in her life before. I'm sorry. Hannah. Ultimately, the couple parts ways. It was hard for me to let her go, but I felt that it was better not to have her than to bear with the pain of, God forbid, something happening to her. I wasn't going to be able to live with myself if that happened. I need help. I need someone to come and tell me what's happening because this isn't right. Once again, Charles turns to his friend, Pedro. Once it starts to get physical, it's when you have to react. Now there's action to be taken. He immediately calls upon his fellow team members, psychic medium Desiree Page and lead investigator Rich Valdez. Have you ever been involved in the occult in any way? What do you mean, like, like witchcraft? No. Never. What about that clay object you found back in Colombia? You told 
told me it was buried. And in Desiree's vision, your grandfather was trying to warn you about something buried, right? Remember? It even had something that looked like your uncle's initials on it. Yeah, but what does that have to do with me? Someone placed a curse on that object with the intent to hurt your uncle. And now, whatever negative entity that was attached to the object is after you. Whatever was going on in Charles's life at the time was probably correlated with the object that he had unburied as a child. Maldito! The transference of energy, especially when it comes to a curse, has no time. It can happen immediately. It can happen a few weeks, a few days, a few years. What may have triggered it finally with Charles is he finally reached that point of complete happiness. And that is when this negative spirit actually started manifesting. And before you knew it, his life was in shambles. Still, Charles doesn't know why anyone would place a curse on his uncle. I don't understand. Why would someone want to hurt him? Did he have any enemies? No. Everyone loved Tio Alfonso. A scorned lover, perhaps? That's when it automatically sparked. The light bulb went off. It was her. anyone was still up. Uh, remember Elena? The pleasure. I know who she is. And she's not welcome in this home. There was talk in the town that she could have been possibly a witch and that she could have been practicing witchcraft. My grandfather did not like her. He did not like her at all. He was pretty angry and told her, you have to leave. Don't come by here. You're not welcome here or even close to, to any of us in the family. Come on, papi. You can be serious. She's got you under some kind of spell, and I won't allow it. Do you understand me? I won't allow you to ruin my family. I remember him telling my uncle, you either pick her or you pick us. It's probably the best that you go. We can work this out later. You coward! You told me you loved me! Lies. And you? You think you're better than me? <laughs> you have no idea what I'm capable of, old man. This isn't the last you've seen of me. woman invoked a curse in order to exact revenge. You think it's so easy to get rid of me? I'll never let you free. Just know this, mi amor. You and your family will pay dearly. Okay, so now what? Huh? We have to break the curse or the entity will continue to haunt you. I felt just like a negative energy. Visit TLC.com.
As a young boy in Colombia, Charles Gonzalez discovered a clay object etched with his uncle's initials. Charles suspects it was created by his uncle's scorned lover, who placed a curse on him and his family. Maldito! She wanted to hurt him. She wanted to damage him. She wanted to hurt the family. And we all felt it. It's now years later. A psychic medium senses that the entity attached to the object has set its sights on its next victim, Charles. Are you okay? It looked like a woman. She was very jealous, um, very possessive, and very angry. This entity was attached to Charles. The entity. It's, it's female by nature, and she wants you all to herself. She's the reason why you and your girlfriend broke up. We have to move now. The future depends on it. In order to break the entity's attachment to Charles and end the curse, the team brings in their occult expert, Angel Garcia. It appears that she was practicing brujeria, which is similar to santeria. And she was creating objects and doing things just to control. Do you have the replica? Yeah. Because Charles does not have the original clay object, he was instructed to recreate it. We needed to have something he can hold, something he can see. It's time. Please, step forward. Angel begins a ritual to end the curse by pouring a salt ring around Charles. Salt has always been known through the years to be protective against anything occult, dark, scary. The ring of salt is a protective circle. So the last thing you need is somebody to pick this up and now carry this burden of, I have the curse with me. So people needed to feel protected. They needed to feel that they were in a sacred space. It was important for all of us to be there during the ritual because we needed everyone's energy. We were all just very on edge and very much wanting to help him and, and get rid of this for him. This isn't something that one person could have handled by themselves. The entity didn't show me itself that night but I could still feel that it was with Charles. It was definitely still there. Santum inum pitilis. Uh, I stood in the middle of that circle and I prayed to my uncle and my grandfather to give me the strength to get rid of this thing, to send it away where it would not hurt anyone. I break the curse cast upon me. And my tío Alfonso Ferdinand Gonzalez and the future members of mi familia. And I grabbed this figure and I crushed it in my hands and I threw it to the sea. and I felt the biggest weight come off immediately. The curse has been broken. You could feel the energy flow different, and it was all stemming from him. He broke this energy physically, feeling he was released. All he did was shift his energy to now, I'm in charge. I'm the one who's protected. I'm the one who destroyed this, and let this be. Mm -hmm. 
Ever since the ritual, Charles is confident he's free of the curse. Life is good today. Life is, life is awesome. And I feel like I'm back to myself again. I can be happy. Paranormal to me now is something so natural, so common. It's like oxygen and water. It, to me, it's very real. If anyone says that it's not real, it's because they're ignorant. Or they haven't been through it themselves. And I hope they, they don't go through it themselves. It's pretty disturbing. It's scary. I don't want to wish that upon nobody.